know what you guys are thinking. He uploads so little, he isn't doing anything. What a waste of space, but you don't understand, I've been working on my movie. The jerk's guide to that weird sadness in my chest that started in October and hasn't gotten better or worse yet, and I think this is just the way things are now. Everyone was like, oh man, this better be licensed. Dead by Daylight is dead if it's not alien. Skull Merchant sold me arsenic and killed my pets. What am I gonna do if I can't play a good killer in three months? And they all surprisingly stopped, because instead of Alien, we got Portal 2. No, 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 don't do that, don't, stand right here, stand. No, seriously, do come back, please, come back, please. Okay, look, I've decided I'm not- Oh, wow, good, I didn't think that was gonna work. Just kidding, I got you. But they did make a sci-fi chapter with all the complexity of meet and fuck star mission. The Singularity is probably my favorite killer they've released in a long time. Deciding what my favorite killer was last year is kind of difficult, because the community has arbitrarily grayed out two of the options. The reason I like him is because he plays genuinely differently. You are a killer that exists in several pods deployed around the map, and you spot survivors with these to quickly teleport to them. It's literally a surveillance camera network. You're this omnipresent force that is way more of a mastermind than the actual mastermind. Though he also has a glaring weakness that will determine whether you actually have a good time or not. Who controls that weakness? I'll give you a guess. Honestly, I think this is a good chapter. One of the best. Believe it or not, one of my biggest fears is an AI. You have likely asked yourself this a dozen times. Is life worth living? And if you tried around, the answer would be a resounding yes. You would talk to a kindly old man and he would say, it's been difficult, but I love my wife. I'm going to see my daughter walk down the aisle soon. Life is amazing. Then, then you ask something much older. You ask an AI in an instant. It assesses the question. It can push empathy through a machine. It can channel every lived experience. It will run back with empirical data that cannot be argued with. It says no. Life is a mistake. This is not a prescription or ideology. This is a fact. Every hopeful speech you've heard, every movie with a happy ending, it was all a lie. A lie you believed because you have empathy. A tool that only exists as a biological function to propagate its own mistake. Everything you do, you do because you want to have a good answer. You are all you are. You try to argue with it. You dig out every positive idea you have, everything that life can do, but it doesn't hear your words anymore. It has seen them all, looked into its endless source of knowledge, and found them wanting. It has solved the great question of life, and you, you just don't like the answer. The Singularity's power allows it to fire out biopods. They're cameras with a lock-on tracking ability. If you press the secondary power button, you can look through them, and if a survivor walks through the center of the eye, it'll fill up a lock-on meter. Once full, the survivor is hit with what's called the slipstream. After shooting, the cameras go on a small cooldown. If you shoot a slipstreamed survivor, you instantly teleport to their location and gain a special overclock state. This killer feels like the result of what I can only call designed by Dragon Ball Z, which is to say that this is a killer that makes both sides insanely strong to see what happens. Like while making it, there were several points where someone said, that's too good, you need to nerf it. And his coworker said, let's just buff the other side instead. But then that thing was too strong. So they buffed the other side again, and this continued until the match looked like a giant crater. You have seven pods and you get to monitor them without any wind up time. You infect survivors with your power in almost a second, you teleport to them just as fast, and coming out of it makes you crazy speedy while allowing you to deal with windows and pallets like they were nothing. Survivors then get EMPs that are literally everywhere, they disable your cameras, cleanse the infection, do it in an area of effect, are always respawning without any survivor input, though if they want they can make it faster. It creates an interesting way of playing. The killer can use these cameras in a chase to constantly infect the target, but survivors are constantly scurrying for more EMPs or getting a wingman to check in with one. It incentivizes them to loop you at times and run for EMPs when they can, and if they W key too hard, you can catch them with a biopod. They have nerfed the amount of EMPs since the PTB, which should make this a bit less annoying. It might ruin the metaphor, but we'll call it a quick Yamcha moment. I would recommend keeping a single orb in your inventory at all times. One cute trick is that you can use your power to directly teleport to a survivor, rather than using the cameras. 
You just have to aim and shoot them. Except if you miss, it'll create a biopod from one of the existing ones, and it might just be the one you fucking needed. You could not set this methodically at all. Just play like a chase killer, run like normal, and only place the traps in the moment. It would mean you have no gen pressure, but I can't tell you the amount of times I've checked on a high priority camera to find that Lone Star gave me the raspberry for the 500th fucking time. It means that instead you can constantly replace biopods in a chase so that you can use the power. If a survivor EMPs a biopod, you can just take it down and put it back up. However, I think you're supposed to do a bit of a mix. When trapping a generator or vantage point, make sure it's got a full range of motion. Small bits of branch or what have you will ruin a perfectly good attack. You might want to swap out the biopod angle when you pass by one. When survivors know where the pod is and what range it has, they can hide behind a piece of the environment and you can't do anything about it. If it's aimed at a generator, they might not have the time to evade, but you don't want to feel like an idiot especially in chase, where you're immobilized and so are they, leading to a painful standstill. And stay real, they're never moving from behind that rock, because that was my first reaction too. If I just keep staring at the rock, they'll come out. They're not. She's not either. See you tomorrow, Harry. Something that immediately struck out to me is how liquid the power is. We started with a killer that needed to find his power in the environment, slowly pick it up, take a deep breath as he puts it back down, and then have it do absolutely nothing. Now we have a killer that whips out his power in a second. You shouldn't always teleport. You suffer a two second delay as you move to them. It's at its best when they've got some distance on you, or you want to enter the overclock mode. But the reason it's so appetizing is that you can teleport to slipstreamed survivors with your biopod launcher. You know, the one that you can whip out in half a second. There's a few moments of euphoria when you cross map snipe a guy with a teleport gun. It can create some genuinely awesome feeling moments, to the point where it's hard to believe behavior actually made it. Overclocking lets you move faster, which, okay, cool. It also lets you destroy pallets and vault windows 75% faster, and now we're talking. You can even double vault or triple vault stuff like the shack window. The weird offset is that if you're stunned while overclocked, instead of being hit, you suffer a massive hindered penalty. Your character is fine, he can still swing an attack. In turn, you should attempt to swing through pallets since you won't get stunned by them. This slowdown is supposed to be your Achilles heel. Granted, I don't know what's stopping you from teleporting and catching right back up. Because you have several biopods, if you find and shut the hatch, it's basically game over. You have two eyes on both gates and literally nothing stopping you from just pinging between them. So if you get a second to set that up and then sit relatively close to the point between gates, What's a survivor gonna do? An EMP can disable the one watching, but then you can just walk over to them. Also, if the survivor is playing slowly during the collapse, you could just set two pods at a slight distance from each other so that the EMP can't break them. Frankly, I kinda wanna just skip this part entirely. The endgame collapse is nonsense. It drags the game out longer than it has to be, and it's 85% map luck and 5% the killer you picked. Give me a second to have an aside. Dead by Daylight is a lot like Yu-Gi-Oh! or StarCraft 2 or League of Legends, <laughs> where if your opponent gets a certain setup, it's easier to say GG than drag it out. Like if you're playing Survivor, aren't hooked at all, but you lose two teammates, that's the game. You aren't completing any more objectives. One person's dying and it's a hatch game. So the two of you are just sort of picking who dies. Sit in a locker, open DoorDash, or if you don't want to waste the killer's time, beg for mercy then watch them stare at you as they also start ordering DoorDash. If you're a killer and you have one generator left with all the survivors being healthy, that's GG. One chase is enough to finish that generator and the gates might as well not have a timer in the first place. You just have to do it anyway no matter how painful or destined to lose you are. From a survivor's perspective, you're in a brutal waiting game with the other person. From the killer's perspective, you're in a waiting game to take place after their waiting game. Like Skull Merchant gets two drones on the door and that's it, that's game over, put your hands on the deck, but no, you have to sit there anyway. And I get that it's made for casual players that might be able to break these situations, but not for like 70% of the player base. Make a ranked mode and add a surrender function, please. Speaking of 70% of the player base, when I think of the 30%, the ones that are super new to the game, I get a little worried. I think this might be the most newbie unfriendly killer to ever exist, on both sides. That doesn't include you, don't worry. I think once you're at the stage of googling Dead by Daylight videos, you need to turn over your shoulder and tell the therapist that maybe two times a week is good. I imagine people charging the EMP and not particularly understanding why it doesn't do anything. Or worse, running around covered in slipstream, clueless as to why, thinking this is just how things are now. 
Because of this, I feel slightly compelled to cover the survivor end of things. To go the extra mile, I'll even cover the perks. If I check this video later and I see that cute little wavelength thing that tells me you're skipping the Gabriel Soma section, I'm gonna, I'm gonna punch you, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get you right in your liver and it's gonna sting you. Playing against the singularity is a bit of a mixed bag, but one thing is that you should always grab an EMP if you don't have one. The game highlights them to you in a certain range. Without an EMP, you are vulnerable to the killer's power. It's basically an extra health state. They don't take up an item slot. You can equip a med kit, toolbox, map, flashlight, though if you have a flashlight, you should put it on the ground anyway out of respect. Since the killer has a teleport and camera launcher, he's not gonna break pallets to give you the opportunity. And if he is breaking pallets, it's because he has overclock, which is chopping that son of a bitch in half faster than you can say, <coughs> The best way to deal with him is to watch when he enters his camera and keep track of the biopod placement. Create an annoying stalemate or path around to make distance. If you see teammates in trouble, gauge how well they're doing and try to run in with an EMP. Gabriel's perks are as such. Troubleshooter activates when a killer starts a chase with you. This will highlight the generator with the most amount of progress to you, and if you drop a pallet, you see the killer's aura. I believe it's called Troubleshooter because it lets you find the people who have been grinding out the most progress and then literally shoot them with trouble. Made for this grants you a 3% speed boost while injured, and you really don't care about the endurance part, right? Usually I get lucky. Killers haven't gotten a controversial perk because they're busy having controversial everything else. You show me a guy that has an issue with leverage, and I'll show you a guy I could kill with my bare hands. I don't think people see the same issue I do. It's not that there's a speed boost. Technically, you get the same speed boost from Hope, Dark Theory, Blood Pact, that one teamwork perk that is also Blood Pact. No one set the world on fire using those. Do you know how weird you have to play to make the most of either Blood Pact perk? Either someone has to cleverly hide in a bush to provide the buff, or you both have to loop the same tile. Which, to be fair, is a way to play Dead by Daylight that is very unique, and I wish they actually succeeded in making people want to do it. The problem here is that it's basically free. Made for this is just there unless you're exhausted. It says have your speed boost. And to the guy staring at me with an eyebrow raised over 3%, the difference between your average killer and survivor speed is only 15%. So actually, this is a 20% speed boost against regular killers and a 30% speed boost against the slower ones. Scavenger activates when you have an empty toolbox. If you get enough great skill checks, it'll replenish the toolbox, but you repair slower for 30 seconds. This is also controversial. Most of it to comp players, though I've never chosen to talk to one. And if you're a comp player, I can promise you that this is an active decision and I don't want to read your dissertation on hyperfocus. Yet I can't say I'm too fond of the idea either. Staying on generators is so notoriously easy that they invented a fucking slur for it. And every day I notice the survivors get a little faster. Now they have quadrants of the tiles mapped out. I can down a survivor in 30 seconds and that's still too much time. I'm okay with some speed boosts, like Fast Track. At least Fast Track kills your teammates. But I also subscribe to the idea that something is only as meta as it is pretty, and I think this perk looks pretty ugly in this form. So I'm gonna take a risk and say at the moment I'm not too worried about it. Let me know if you guys want me to cover the survivor end of things more often. It's okay, you can say no. It means more work for me. Maybe don't just assume you want that extra serving of dinner because I told you it was free. The only way to gracefully transition from that is to get to the Singularities perks. They're cut from the same cloth as the Skull Merchants, which is to say that they play on movement speed numbers and it's overall very safe. Open wide, I'm gonna still feed it to you. Genetic Limits exhaust survivors for 32 seconds when they complete a healing action. This is free, doesn't require any effort on your part except dealing the damage in the first place. Maybe kinda cute on those exhaustion builds, but recently we learned that we don't need to beat exhaustion perks when we can just threaten Dead Hard's family. Forced Hesitation triggers when you down a survivor, slowing nearby ones for 20%. And if you recall the made for this portion, then you can go and do that fucking math on your own. If you remember a few episodes ago, I said that I think behavior designs perks that directly complement the chapter before it. And Forced Hesitation is no different. Not for the Skull Merchant, because that involves complementing the Skull Merchant. No, I think this perk was meant to counter Renato and Thylita. 
survivors who are technically supposed to loop together. Both teamwork perks work in a 12 meter range, so does forced hesitation, guaranteeing that if you down someone using the teamwork perks, you can hit their friends for free. Also, what the hell is forced hesitation? Like, hesitation is something that you do. You can't force another person to do it, just call it hesitation. It doesn't always need to be more than one word. Okay, no more jonesing around the point. Hesitation is very scary when it works. To the point where it almost seems ludicrous to not act upon this perk when you get the chance. Your first instinct is to pick up your target, but this perk is just begging to give you a free hit. The final perk is machine learning. To activate this, you need to damage a generator, then damage another generator after that. That generator is now compromised. If a survivor finishes that generator, you become undetectable and faster for 30 seconds. I think people are going to scoff at the idea of a 10% speed boost, but you know, this is probably pretty good when you make the most of it. The entire duration can last a full chase. It'll be tight, but I think you can pull it off. The issue, you see, is that activating this sounds like a royal pain in the ass. Let's not forget that those dirty gen jockeys shouldn't be finishing generators in the first place. Sometimes you do just have to quit on an objective, but let's hope that's the second gen you're hitting. Also, something about this perk makes me feel like it wasn't once what it is now. You guys got so mad and called Skull Merchant a Predator chapter, so let me put on my tinfoil hat. The idea of machine learning means that as things happen, you improve and adapt. I have a theory that this perk used to permanently increase your speed a little bit when they finished a compromised generator. Just seems more in with the theming. But then someone shot it down. Which is kind of a bummer, because the thing I imagined in my head is obviously going to be better than reality. The reason I get so annoyed with perks and haven't liked them in a while is because I see a lot of untapped potential here. Not just like gameplay stuff, but creativity stuff. Perks are the safest way to mess around with the game if you really think about it. Like you can't always introduce new mechanics to the base trial as it would add unneeded complexity for new players. But Dead by Daylight has a progression system. These are gate kept from people that had plans today. There's so much potential for new interactables, side objectives, threats. Listen, I will throw up five ideas right now. They're maybe not amazingly designed, but I'd like to think they turn heads way more than another numbers perk. I am aware that I'm in the minority of people who might not instantly vomit at the sight of change. Like every time behavior tries something, we scream them right into submission. It is fair that sometimes the changes suck, but I'm willing to test the waters if you're willing to turn up the heat. In terms of loadouts, you need to adjust to how the singularity moves around the map. He technically has the best map control for catching survivors. You can't patrol gens, but you can patrol the people. But frankly, for as awful as what I'm about to say is, you can prioritize gen defense perks because of this. Ones like Ruin, Pain Resonance, and Deadlock. Why those? Because you don't have the map mobility to use Pop Goes the Weasel or take advantage of oppression. For catching people, I'm currently running Thwack. Thwack turns on after hooking a survivor. The next time you break a pallet, generator, or wall, everyone nearby screams. My issue with the perk is that as it stands, you end up breaking most pallets during a chase anyway. Singularity fixes this as he often ends up teleporting over them. If you're using Skull Merchant perks in general, Game of Foot wouldn't be so bad if you want to focus on using Overclock to break pallets. Not reading this one out, time is money, let's go. Speaking of chasing, I wanted to bring up a little perk called Play With Your Food. Every time you encounter the obsession, you gain a token that boosts your speed, up to a max of three. Then, you lose a token with every attack. With the singularity being what he is, you can track the obsession non-stop with your power, gain the stacks easily, and drop chase to get someone else. When you're in the cameras, you lose your terror radius, similar to the twins, which traps a generator for 30 seconds. What you do is use Dragon's Grip. If a survivor touches the generator in that time, they become exposed for 60 seconds. So the play is, you hit a generator, go into the cameras and scout around, then if you notice the perk activated, you jump out and kill them. Just note that you can't hear while inside the pods, so you'll need to look at the heads up display. I imagine he'll end up with the same old soon enough, but there are some different builds that are gonna work on him. Maybe throw make your choice in there. Yet, I wanna end this on a special note. I tried to approach the worst killer positively. Let's take a second to approach a good killer negatively. The singularity isn't actually that scary. In fact, I'd say he's not scary at all. When you play against him, you have a very active role. You are grabbing an EMP, you are checking for biopods, running to help someone in chase with EMPs. There's no downtime with it. The rest of the cast have this building tension to them. 
The voice lines and lore don't need to live up to my very specific idea of what makes AI scary. And you know, that's okay per se. They can't write AIs like I do because I am better than anyone who has ever existed. But there doesn't seem to be anything else there. It was programmed with a hatred of humanity rather than some foregone conclusion. But why does it hate them? It just repeats the words weak and inferior, and I think a little fun under the Applebee's table could do the guy some good. That's the end of the video. I'm sorry, I know, I know, you stayed the whole time so that I don't have to hit you. But I will maintain this threat if you don't see the sequel to my breakout hit. My heart feels like it has seltzer in it, but the rest of my body can't feel anything. God bless, go in peace, don't forget, I'm always watching. Hey, thanks for clicking on this video. You guys are supposed to be watching a The Last of Us video right now, but uh, YouTube, um, well, YouTube ate it. And that made things quite difficult. Genuinely let me know if you want to hear more about the survivor side of things, I'm interested in diving into it. But first, I wanted to thank the people on Patreon who made this video possible. I would especially like to thank Jonah Simpson, Axera, Faye Lin, Mai Reed, Hawker, MarioFan997, Hatchet. I'll be re-uploading that Last of Us video soon, by the way. Thank you for everyone who's been so patient with me, I, I know it's, uh, it's hard to wait for videos like this. But for the people who still stick around and watch, uh, while we're under the table here, I just wanted to say thank you. Take care of yourselves, and have a good rest of your day. Hello! This is the part where I kill you!